All of us know the sting of not getting something that we want, but when faced with the same situation, one man would take things too far and leave a family torn apart for the rest of their lives. That man was George Silva, the son of Sri Lankan parents living and working in the Australian town of Mackay. George was born in 1884, and though he grew up in poverty, he found a passion to keep him going that didn't require him to have much money. George was a staunch and passionate supporter of the church, and despite his humble background, he managed to make himself an integral part of his local church and even led his own prayer services when a replacement was needed for the usual ones. Growing up with this firm belief and an outlet for his passions, George Silva became a confident young man with big ambitions that only continued to grow when he found his first job as a farmhand on a farm in Alligator Creek, just 20 miles out of Mackay. This farm was owned by a man named Charlie Ching, an immigrant originally from Hong Kong who married a woman named Agnes. The Chings didn't have much, aside from the farm itself, and by modern standards, what they did have wouldn't exactly be considered to be the highest standard of living. They lived in a home made out of corrugated iron that had dirt as the floor, the kitchen wasn't attached to the home, but was actually in a separate building, so the family had to go from building to building whenever they wanted or needed something from the kitchen. But to George, this family provided him with a sense of hope that he'd never had before. While living and working with them, George grew to know the family, and there was one family member in particular that wormed her way into George's heart. That was 17-year-old Maud Ching, the eldest daughter of the family, and George set his sights on her to be his future wife. He went about trying to set himself up to be in a better position so that he could support her and the family that they could have together, and actually went to a neighbour of the Chings to discuss a plot of land that he intended to buy. His plan was to buy a house there by the end of the year and make it presentable, so he could go to the Chings and ask if he could marry Maud. It's difficult to say if Maud was actually interested in marrying George herself, but the differences between the two families' financial situations were summed up by a neighbour that George had spoken to. When he asked why George was interested in that particular plot of land, George told him about his plans to propose to Maud Ching, and the neighbour responded by saying, You can't marry. You've got no money. You've got no blanket. No decent trousers. How would a girl like to marry you like that? George didn't listen to this neighbour and believed that simply having access to that plot of land would be enough to prove that he had plans of only bettering his situation and would be a viable husband to Maud. But perhaps a surprise to no one except George himself, the Chings disagreed. They didn't think that George could provide for Maud and they refused to let him marry her. George seemed to take this projection on the chin and continued to work for the family like nothing had happened, but on the inside, George couldn't let it go. When Charles Ching told George that he had to head into Mackay for the day to pick up some supplies for the home and money for George's wages, he saw him off and then George got to work. The next time Charles saw George, he was sitting outside the part of the house where the family lived and he told Charles that the family were out visiting neighbours. Charles didn't find that suspicious but he tried to open the door so he could put some of the things he'd gotten from Mackay inside and found that the door was locked. 
This also wasn't suspicious, as Agnes would often have a key on her, and it was possible that she'd locked up the main part of the house before she'd left. Planning on waiting for them all to come home, Charles and George headed over to the separate building that had the kitchen inside to have something for dinner, but when it got late and no one had come home yet, Charles became anxious. He first tried speaking to the neighbours, but no one had seen the family. They could tell Charles one thing, however, but it wasn't good. Shots had been heard coming from the direction of his home earlier that day, and no one had seen the family since. Thinking the worst, Charles rushed back to his home, where he and George broke a window on the side of the house and climbed inside. But what waited for him was a gruesome sight. Everything from the floor to the ceiling was covered in blood spatters and the family was nowhere to be seen. Charles frantically searched the property but he found everyone except the two middle children hidden under a rug in the main living area. Agnes and Maud had been shot, and Hugh and Winnie, who were only four years and 20 months old, were found with their heads smashed in from where they'd been dashed against the wall. A Bible had been placed on the top of the rug and on top of the bodies, almost like an afterthought or even an apology, showing some sort of remorse. Charles realised that his family had been murdered, but he was still missing his 10-year-old son, Teddy, and his 8-year-old daughter, Dolly, and he knew that he needed help finding them. He sent George on a horse to get the police, and when explaining what had waited for them back at the house, George said, Oh Lord, I never saw anything in my life like this. The police quickly arrived at the farmstead, but it was dark and any searches for the two missing children had to wait until daylight. They came back with search teams and an Aboriginal tracker named Charlie Dayton, who followed the path the children would have taken home from school, where they'd last been seen, and found them about a kilometre away from the farm. One of them had died from blunt force trauma, and the other had been shot. Around the bodies were boot prints that matched the shape and size of George Silva's, and witnesses had seen him picking up the younger children from school that day. Charlie had also not found any extra set of prints around the property where the rest of the family had been found and the police only continued to grow more suspicious of George. He couldn't provide them with a solid alibi and with news spreading about the murders, the community began to suspect him as well. Fearing that he'd find himself on the wrong end of an angry mob, George turned himself into the police and confessed to murdering the Ching family. He later said that he'd had help from two other neighbours and hadn't actually committed any of the murders himself, but he did, however, lead the investigators straight to the murder weapon and sealed his own fate. He was tried only for killing Maud Ching, the daughter that he'd once wanted to marry, and the trial lasted for two full days before the jury adjourned to deliberate. It took them only 20 minutes to find him guilty of murder, and at the time, Australia had a mandatory death sentence for anyone found guilty of that charge. George was sentenced to death by hanging and taken to prison to await his execution. When that day came, George was led to the gallows where his arms and legs were bound and he was allowed to say his final words. George stood in front of the waiting crowd and his days of preaching and leading prayer services came in handy for the last time. He managed to talk to the crowd for over 20 minutes, first coming across somewhat sympathetic and almost pitiful to the people gathered to witness his execution. 
He started with the words, quote, I desire to thank the superintendent of this jail and the warders for all their kindness in coming to see me and visiting me and leading me to the throne of God. But then he complained about the injustices that had been done to him. He claimed that the police and the witnesses who testified at his trial had all lied and that he hadn't murdered the Ching family. He warned his own family and friends about the dangers of suddenly finding themselves where he was now and told them to always be good Christians so that their souls would be saved. And then he began to quote long passages from the Bible. When he was done, he started another, sometimes repeating himself over and over again. And by then, everyone realised that he had only been stalling. The decision was made to cut him off, and when he saw the warden approaching the gallows, George said, quote, And dear friends, I tell you now, I say to you, a merry goodbye. I am going to heaven. I am going now. I am going to heaven. He kept saying this until he had to stop for the executioner to place the noose around his neck, and then he started again, muttering to himself all the way up until the floor gave way and his neck was snapped. After confessing, George had later claimed that the police had beaten his confession out of him and he'd only ever turned himself in to avoid getting caught by the mob, but he certainly had a convincing enough motive after being humiliated by the Chings and Maud. He'd also been seen with the middle children right before they were murdered, and he'd been able to lead the police right to the murder weapon. There was also no physical evidence to prove that there were ever other people involved like George had claimed there had been, and no other tracks were found at the scene, meaning that if George had been the one to kill them, he'd more than likely worked alone.